For 15 years, World of Warcraft has touched and changed the life of many. All of us share stories of how we discovered and started playing this MMORPG, from not knowing how to do a quest to defeating its greatest and most badass challenges or maybe even the smaller challenges. We all share a story of how we got lost in this world of Azeroth, how we have met people or how we discovered something fun and unexpected. But World of Warcraft on itself has a bigger history, a story, if you will, of how it came to be and how ultimately became one of the biggest and most well-known games of its time and one, if not the best, MMORPG to date. So let's go back in time, not just to the time of the highly cherished vanilla, but to a time where the word world was put into Warcraft. Warriors wielded axe and spear with deadly proficiency, while others rode dark wolves as black as the moonless night. Unimagined were the destructive powers of their evil magics derived from the fires of the underworld. With an ingenious arsenal of weaponry and powerful magic, these two forces collide in a contest of cunning, intellect, and brute strength with the victor claiming dominance over the whole of Azeroth. Welcome to the world of Warcraft. The real-time strategy game Warcraft Orcs vs Humans in 94 was the very first time we ever got to see this yet very infant universe. These older titles might appear very simple and almost funny to us, as the voice lines seem to be recorded by a random ass developer, and as a fun fact, the famous introduction dialogue was fully performed by the producer himself and improvised on the spot. Stop poking me! Story and lore setup was present, but it was far from Blizzard's goal at this point. Hell, partially the game was still based on the Lost Vikings platformer, Blizzard's first ever game, and you can find the biggest of these inspirations alive on the orc characters with their horn helmets. Nowadays, we gush, make videos, threads and theories about how crazy and awesome this world and universe is, but back then, gameplay was the main and only goal. Warcraft came during a time where RTS game releases were far in between. It was almost as if the genre was dying out, and as such, Warcraft, along with other titles like Command and Conquer, burst new life into the genre, and almost boom, and set a foundation for many Blizzard RTS titles to come. The Orcish warriors yearn for the sounds of battle to fill the air, and look to the far horizon for new blood to spill. Using the weapons forged by their new allies, the humans made haste to prepare for the onslaught. Like many great sequels, Warcraft 2 built upon the original success, setting out to create a game that was bigger and better in every possible way. And it wasn't just gameplay and general quality that was improved, the stories, the lore grew vaster and vaster, the world was bigger than ever before, dealing with themes of not only in the traditional Tolkien-esque high fantasy, but also having this steampunkish elements, and it was the first time we saw all the machinery that since became iconic in Azeroth, like the Zeppelins. It introduced stories and lands that only recently we got to visit in the MMO, more than 20 years later, and is when many known faces like Chris Metzen came in to create these same stories and develop further its fictional universe. But Warcraft 2, along with titles released around this time, such as Starcraft and Diablo, set Blizzard to be among the elite developers at the time, and so the Blizzard polish, the Blizzard name that made everyone go excited in their nether regions started to become ever more prevalent in the gaming community, but they were not done yet. Far from it. 
monks arise to challenge fate and lead their brethren to battle. As mortal armies rush blindly towards their doom, the burning shadow comes to consume us all. From Warcraft 2 to Warcraft 3, there was a much bigger gap of about five years, if counting expansions. One of the reasons for such a delay, if we can call it that, was because after Warcraft 2, the IP took a turn to follow a more story-focused game, known as Warcraft Adventures, a point-and-click graphic adventure that told the story of Thrall, from his days as a prisoner to becoming the leader of his Orcish clan. Ultimately, the title was cancelled after two years into production, and as you know now, that story was beautifully within in Warcraft 3. Unbeknownst to many, Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft actually shared productions. What's crazier is that Warcraft 3 amazing expansion, The Frozen Throne, released just a year before WoW in 2003. They were interestingly linked, and as such, both titles actually shared staff like the lead designer Rob Pardo, and even co-designed many aspects, and I think it's clear by looking at characters and their abilities, the general design and art of the world, this being the first in the series to utilize the more cartoony and the more vibrant palette that we know now. Warcraft 3 also introduced something very unique to the RTS genre, the hero characters, and it was almost as if RPG elements were starting to enter the Warcraft games more and more, possibly influenced by its co-developed game being at its core an RPG. The stories told were now done in the perspective of these same characters, like Thrall, Arthas, setting up many aspects and storylines to be further expanded in the MMO. It was far different to anything Blizzard had ever produced. So far, they had done primarily RTS games and ARPGs, but MMOs were booming in the late 90s and early 2000s with titles like EverQuest, RuneScape, and Ultima Online. It was increasingly popular not only with gamers, but also a very profitable model, which traditionally included a subscription. And so, we had been through the stories of Thrall in Warcraft 3, we went through a Legion invasion, and not forget the amazing story of Arthas, with his inevitable downfall to become the Lich King. We had an amazing multiplayer experience that on itself created a whole other genre through mods, MOBAs. So could an MMORPG live up to the hype? Could it replace what it was once primarily an RTS series to become in essence an RPG that you yourself as a player could explore at your own leisure together with thousands of other people? Well. Four years have passed since the mortal races banded together and stood united against the might of the Burning Legion. Though Azeroth was saved, the tenuous pact between the Horde and the Alliance has all but evaporated. The drums of war thunder once again. World of Warcraft quickly gained renown and acclaim to be one of the best MMORPGs to date. Some might have been upset that Warcraft 4 wasn't made and that seemingly the era of Warcraft RTSs were over. But you know, who wasn't ready for all the hordes of players wanting to play the game? Well, Blizzard. The developers and primarily all the people in charge of the servers simply weren't expecting that WoW could get so much attention, and so, as many of you know now, the servers just could not handle all that traffic, and the game was pretty much unplayable for the first few weeks, if not months. They were simply not prepared. 
But regardless of this unfortunate events, World of Warcraft created a world where thousands of people could get lost into. It brought many innovative ideas and technology never seen, but before we get there, let's talk a bit more about why WoW was created. And yes, partially it was money. It was a very popular franchise and a very popular genre to tap into that subscription model. And it came out at the perfect time where the current MMOs were starting to get old and boring. But the big main reason is of course passion. Many WoW developers, or rather Warcraft developers, were die-hard fans of MMORPGs or had worked on other titles. Rob Pardo, Alex Afrisby... Tom Shilton, Jeff and many others shared the same passion for MMOs. They were avid players of EverQuest, leading guilds, some even leading top worldwide ones, and so EverQuest was used as a foundation, as a groundworks for the early concepts and core mechanics of WoW, and it wasn't just their thoughts and desires, but feedback from the community at the time was also taken in heavy consideration when first creating the game. And one of the main goals coming over from it, from EverQuest, was to have that feeling of a community that EverQuest also offered, but adding more defined goals, a bigger sense of purpose that ironically has been lost in the recent years of the game. In essence, the goal was to create a better EverQuest MMO experience, and of course, set it now in the loved and fascinating Warcraft universe. Hell, looking at early alpha footage of WoW, the graphic style was still a little far from the cartoony and vibrant colors and exaggerated shapes that we know today. The general feel was much more akin to EverQuest or most other MMOs. There was some interesting ideas, of course, like in Duskwood, how originally it was meant to be a much scarier and dark zone where darkness actually blended with gameplay, but ultimately, the stylized art style that we now know, that was partially captured in Warcraft 3, made it into the game. And it's crazy to see how the fidelity of it was improved over from the alpha in just about a year. Except for the gnolls, uh, those poor sods have been using the same model from alpha to BFI. But even after 15 years, the art style, though somewhat subjective, has aged like a fine wine. But World of Warcraft was simply an MMORPG made by MMORPG players for MMORPG players, from nerds to nerds, but was still very much inclusive to every kind of MMO player, be the guy that wants to play for 10 hours a day or the guy that only wants to play 2 hours, 1 hour. Anything that you did felt meaningful and rewarding, from just leveling, focusing on professions, or the more hardcore approach of raiding and PvPing. Being casual friendly was one of the many aspects heavily praised by reviewers at the time. Remember, many MMOs of this era had a permadeath systems or loss of all items and gear anytime you died in PvP and many other hardcore features we label today. But WoW had found a middle ground with its unique ideas of rested experience that didn't punish people for not playing the game for hours on end flight paths that enabled you to essentially reach zones quicker. Questing also became a valid way of leveling up, with clear pointers to where the quests were and where to deliver them. We might take all of this for granted, or looking back upon it, we might even say it's dated, like the questing in comparison to now, there weren't a lot of them, and were mostly kill quests. Finally, the game was initially intended to have even fewer quests, and be more sandboxy, with quests only to point you in the right directions. But over time, developers like Rob Pardo noticed that hitting the point where you were without quests made the game feel broken. So, even more quests were added to try and make each zone complete. Most were still boring kill and fetch quests as they were easy to implement, but it was far from the grind that other MMOs presented around this time, or from the on-rails style of questing we have today. It was still heavily forcing you to go to all the different zones to find each nuggets of quests in order to level up, and that sometimes, for a more or less knowledged player, could be seen as a huge negative, as you had to resort to just grind mobs if you didn't know better, or just look it up on Thoughtbot. 
Uh, with that said, there was one aspect that World of Warcraft did by far, far better than any other MMO at the time, and even to this day, the world. It was massive, yet there was no looting screens whatsoever in 2004. It's 2019 and we still get games, not even MMOs, littered with loading screens. Yet, there was this MMO that had been in production since the early 2000s that got away by crossing an entire continent without a single loading screen. This alone just made the world feel so real and alive. People running from zone to zone, questing, huge hordes of players rushing to a raid or instance. It was just beautiful. And well, you had to like it because there was a lot of walking in classic, amounts were expensive and late in game, so walking and exploring and admiring each and every zone was a big part of the game. It really made it the massively part of an MMO, well, feel massive. Who doesn't remember the Wetlands run? If you were an idol of looking to reach Stormwind, or as an alliance trying to reach the Scarlet Dungeons. Yes, they were a pain in the ass, but at the same time they created a journey and a great story to tell after all these years. But the world also went through many hurdles. At release, we had two huge continents to explore. Kalimdor and the Eastern Kingdoms, or Lodoran and Azeroth, as they used to be called, both with a plethora of zones to get into. But back in the Alpha, or even looking at earlier iterations of Azeroth, it was half the size of what we got, if that. A lot of the zones were based on previous explored areas, both from Warcraft 3 and 2, but most were created to accommodate the game as an MMO, and the developers were quite ambitious because not only were they able to create all these zones to be filled with quests and stories and lore, but many others were scrapped, like the Dragon Isles, an early version of Hellfire Peninsula, or rather Outlands, and even an Emerald Dream-like area. All these zones were quite unique, but also felt very different from the others present in the game, and partially the reason for their removal was the disparity they presented in comparison to those same other zones that we had. But it's quite fascinating to think that later expansions brought all those concepts back, even in Legion more than 10 years later still used assets from that much data mines and weird area that players had wondered about for years. What's even cooler is that the first expansion for WoW was intended to be a pirate expansion where both Kul'Tiras and Zandalar were present. In fact, early maps of Azeroth pointed Zandalar as a Horde Island. Ultimately, that didn't make the cut, and not for the lack of will, but lack of technology as the servers could not contain any more zones and the new world map had to be created, being Outland. But that's a story for another time. But it goes without saying that the world created here was, for a lack of a better word, breathtaking in every possible way, just like any massively multiplayer game should be. But we also wanted to make sure that there was a separation of roles between every class. Something we didn't want to do was have just a few classes and then have a bunch of hybrid classes that fit in between. Obviously, some classes ended up on the cutting room floor, and a couple of those classes we mention up here is the, like the Necromancer was a uh, popular unit in Warcraft 3. Obviously, makes sense as a class. Didn't quite make it in. Um, the Death Knight was another example of a uh, very popular hero type in Warcraft 3 that didn't make it. Classes, races, and essentially our characters also went through many hoops, but the general philosophy of classes going into WoW was to make characters have 30 to 40 abilities, while each class could bring a unique flavor, from not only a skill set perspective, but small features that made them unique, like Shaman with totems and its respective quests, warrior stances and again its respective quests, lockpads and etc. And that is quite funny to look at when comparing to the current class design, not that they were perfect, many specs felt practically incomplete and awfully imbalanced, I got to get more warriors and rogues, am I right? 
The combat was also heavily praised at how fluid and responsive it was in comparison to all other MMOs. It was almost deemed action-y, with minimal downtimes and low global cooldowns, though ironically now we label the classic combat as super slow and not action-y at all, especially comparing to live. Furthermore, many of these character archetypes existed in Warcraft 3, like paladins and mages, and though some design ideas originated from it, an RPG character to a hero character from an RTS were vastly different. So many core rules with the lore and even other rules set in Warcraft 3 had to be broken, especially when it came to the factions of Horde and Alliance, like uh, female Night Elf Druids, which would go against the lore at the time. As for shamans, for example, were a mix of both the classic shaman in Warcraft 3 with the orcs, but with the Witch Doctor influences, which were primarily trolls, which blended the totem gameplay into the other lightning-based gameplay that the Shaman presented. They were also only available to the Horde side, while the Alliance had the Paladins, which at the time, these classes were so embedded in the lore that the developers decided to leave that exclusivity to add different flavors to both factions. That is, until BC, as needless to say, the exclusivity, though cool and and a unique idea was not easy to balance encounters around. There's many other interesting tidbits about races and classes of WoW, but that would take hours and hours to go through, so let's talk a little bit about the endgame portion of it and how all of that worked out. He's yeah, he's, he's not emerged. emerged. Now yeah. he's emerged. emerged. Oh, oh, here comes the pain, bitch! Previously I mentioned how the game and servers had a lot of problems handling the huge influx of people, but another problem came with players reaching max level and seemingly having not a lot of content to do. Blizzard had focused most of their efforts in providing the general MMORPG experience, but didn't really thought about the longevity of it that an MMORPG traditionally has. This was their first production in the genre after all, and this is clearly seen with the endgame content. In-game zones were incomplete, like the Eastern Plaguelands and Silithus. PvE did provide some dungeons to run through, but raids they weren't even planned to be released at the release dates outside of the one-boss raid on Nyx's lair, with the legendary mechanics of tail swiping into eggs and deep breathing more. It was just random, by the way. Just, uh, yeah. The philosophy with dungeons and raiding back then were to, in essence, make them massive. The bigger the better, and that is clearly shown with dungeons like Stratholme, Upper Blackhawk Spire, that were meant for more than five players. Well, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, Alright, comes up! Ready, guys, Let's or? do this! Leroy Dragons! or even Deadmites, the initial dungeon for the Alliance that essentially served as almost a blueprint that every dungeon that came after followed. Dungeons were places that were meant for you to spend hours in, to get lost in them, sometimes literally, <coughs> Black Hawk Depths, and overcome its challenges. And raids, taking aside Onyxia, were meant to be even bigger, with 40 man raids probably being the biggest clue to achieve that. But when it came to raids themselves, in terms of their design, Karazhan was the first big one that Blizzard initially worked on. It never got to see the light of day till BC, but Karazhan was built so large back in vanilla that the final version, though still massive, had to be cut down. Ever wondered why Karazhan Tower, that weird version, existed in vanilla and all those creepy crypts? Yeah, they were the byproduct of this very same test raid. In the end, Molten Core became the first big raid to be released, but in actuality, it was rushed through development, reusing assets already present in the game, and I think it's quite evident when a large portion of the bosses look practically the same, or just bigger versions of regular mobs, taking aside of course the almighty Ragnaros, the one being that could make anyone hyped about raiding to finally see that famous emerging animation from its fiery depths. There were many bugs, uh, that's for sure, but remember Blizzard wasn't 
the huge company of today, and it was their first MMO. Uh, testing teams were limited, players knowing how to play the game was even fewer, so inevitably bugs were ever present with each content release of vanilla, and Molten Core was not free of this fact. But bugs aside, raids that followed Molten Core followed the same core ideas, but being more complete and polished. Uh, to some extent, like Blackwing Lair, Zulg Rub, or even the world bosses, and quickly raiding became another aspect that wowed the better in comparison to all other MMOs available. And though most people were clueless with shitty internet NPCs, it made a large portion of the player base fall in love with raiding and pursue that level of prestige with each and every tier, until Blizzard decided to come up with uh, something different something special. The Gates of Anchorage is seen as this legendary event, both from people that participated in it and those that didn't. A large part of the event was boring fetch work, but the end result was, well, awesome. And taking aside the lag and the 5 FPS gameplay, but again, you got to admit that the server-wide event of this scale was an insane undertaking back in 2005, in every possible way, but Blizzard still did it because they thought it was simply cool and awesome. And taking aside its technical issues, Anchorage as a premise was simply epic. And then there was Nexramas, probably the most badass and epic raid of Vanilla. In general, Vanilla raids were all over the place thematically and lore-wise, but Nexramas was one hell of a way to end the overall experience and journey. Not only there was this huge path and, again, journey to even be able to reach it, as you had to go through every single tier, no matter what point in the game you started playing, every Everything about it was just in a different league in comparison to the other raids. The aesthetics, the tier sets, the bosses, the overall design of wings, a raid design idea that is still used to this day. Not only that, Nextramas, though a raid barely ran by players at the time and only finished by even less than 1% of the player base, was set to such a high standard in players' minds around the internet, with this sort of mystique around it, it became something out of legend, of how crazy, hard and awesome it was. And guess what? No other raid to this day, being WoW or any other MMORPG, has ever replicated such effects in the player base and the community. That's really quite insane to think about. The Argent Dawn is finished! Soldiers of the Scourge! Indians of the Darkness! Hear the call of the High Lord! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what is this? As for PvP, it was barely existent at first. Taking aside world PvP and ganking, the only option to PvP in WoW was the famous South Shore vs Terran Mill made up battleground. Why? Well, simply because it had a fast respawn, or rather close graveyards that players could get back in the fight quick. And it was needless to say a mess, but it's quite unique to see that such event happened so organically with the player base across all servers, but why was that? Why did PvP felt so incomplete in vanilla? Was it time constraints? Well, partially, as Alterac Valley as a battleground was worked on before the release, but only came much later in the patch, along with Arson Gulch, and well, they proved highly successful. Alterac Valley lasting for days on end is probably the stories we've heard, but PvP in WoW was often brushed aside by the development team, as it was all about the PvE experience at the time, especially at endgame. And finally, even Alterac Valley included PvE elements, but ultimately the PvP side of WoW was the one piece of content that felt the most lacking when it came to features, having to wait for patches to actually make it worthwhile and with decent rewards. All in all, World of Warcraft was an MMORPG about community, being 
the massively multiplayer online part, not only in the game from all the things we discussed, but outside of it, spawning all those amazing videos and machinimas, legends like Nexramas, that now serve for all of us to bathe in nostalgia. You compare that to most other MMOs and you simply cannot find that same impact in the player base. Then there was the RPG part, the pursuit of long-term goals, goals that the game offered but that you yourself set out to chase, and feeling damn rewarded once succeeded, being the role-playing game part, which will also be in beautiful harmony with the community part. Being wrecked by someone in PvP, in full epics, seeing someone in town looking uniquely in some badass armor, or seeing a raid of guildies passing by you while you're just leveling killing bars. All of that made you want to be part of the community and be part of the game in more meaningful ways and reach those high goals that both you and the game set out to chase. And it is unfortunate that many of these aspects have been forgotten in the current MMORPG spectrum, even with all those WoW clones it spawned years after its release. And maybe with the upcoming classic, where we can relive these adventures, current WoW and other MMOs might take some notes on what makes an MMORPG good and bad. But in the end, 15 years ago, the answer to this question had already been found. It wasn't perfect, but after many issues and challenges, a world brimming with passion and creativity was inevitably created.